I'm Eli Epstein, and I'm here with Dr. Peter Iltis, Professor of Horn and Kinesiology at Gordon College. We're presenting a short series of talks about how horn pedagogy is informed by science. I'm excited about new information that's come to light with the advent of this new technology of real-time MRI movies. Teachers generally teach what they can directly observe. When facets of horn playing are hidden from view, Teachers generally rely on their best guesses based on their own internal experiences of what's happening when they play. But not anymore. Over the past two years, scientists at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry have been working with Peter to discover what movements actually go on inside the bodies of some of the finest horn players in the world as they play. Using this new window on a world previously hidden brings new compelling information about how this elite group of horn players performs with ease, health, and the highest level of artistry. Peter, can you tell us about your collaboration with scientists in Germany? I'd be happy to, Eli. Dr. Jens Fromm, Director of Magnetic Resonance Imaging Research at the Max Planck Institute, for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, Germany, and Dr. Eckhart Altenmüller, Director of the Institute for Music Physiology and Musicians Medicine in Hanover, Germany, began a pilot study in 2013, applying RT-MRI technology to a brand new field, studying movements inside the mouths of brass players. Why do this? Well, Dr. Altenmüller is a world authority on a movement disorder known as musician's dystonia. In brass players, this typically affects the muscles that control the embouchure, as well as perhaps the tongue and throat. And Dr. Altenmiller had hopes that using this technology might be helpful in furthering our understanding of embouchure dystonia by providing a way of looking at movements inside the mouth and throat that might potentially be affected. I was invited to come on board in 2013 because of my experience as a horn player, my own development of embouchure dystonia, and finally, because of my interest as a science doing research trying to understand embouchure dystonia. The early thinking was essentially this. We had films of dystonia patients already. Eckhart and Jens Fromm had obtained these previously. But we really had no idea how what we saw on these MRI films actually related to normal. Nor did we know how to make measurements of the movements we witnessed. We also realized that elite players must be doing things right. And so the question was this, what do their movements look like? And what can we learn from them? Are their movements exemplary? And how would they compare to horn players with embouchure dystonia? As we started to conduct some experiments and look at these films, we saw a broader application. It came to me that this information could be used very effectively in brass pedagogy and particularly in horn pedagogy. And that's when I thought to speak with Eli Epstein as I knew he had deep interest in these ideas. Now, in the past, in order to see structures inside the body, we have had to rely on technologies like X-ray imaging. In this X-ray image, side view of a head, we can see structures inside that we otherwise would not be able to see. And of course, these are very, very helpful images in diagnosing things like bone breaks and such. But this kind of imaging is quite limited in that it doesn't show anything about soft structures inside the body. Furthermore, X-ray imaging is dangerous. We know that the rays that we get exposed to are not good for our health. And the idea of using X-ray technology, although there are a couple of films out there of brass players, the idea of using X-ray in a series of systematic studies on many brass players is simply prohibitive and really would be unethical because of the risks. Enter the world of magnetic resonance imaging. With the development of what I'll call traditional MRI, scientists gain the ability to safely examine structures within the body. Magnetic resonance imaging is not dangerous, and the images that are obtained 
include soft tissue, like various organs. Just look at the structures inside the head of this individual on the film. Beautiful images of the brain and substructures of the brain are there for us to see. And surely, if we wanted to study the movements of the tongue, or at least the position of the tongue, in static images like this, traditional MRI would be very useful. But traditional MRI is limited because it's looking at isolated moments in time. How much better would it be if we could actually see movement? And that's where RT MRI comes into the picture. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But just for now, let me say that real-time MRI, RT MRI, allows us to take thousands of pictures in very short time epochs so that we can see movement just as one might see it looking at a movie filmed by a movie camera. Of course, the very idea of obtaining any kind of MRI image inside a scanner poses some real problems for us, particularly in terms of the instrument itself. For one thing, MRI scanners provide very cramped quarters that preclude using a traditional horn. And furthermore, MRI relies on subjecting the body to very strong magnetic fields, something that one intuitively might think makes using a horn in these situations pretty difficult, if not impossible. Thus, the first films that we made in Germany were of performers simply buzzing on a plastic mouthpiece inside the scanner. In fact, it was a plastic mouthpiece attached to a burp device. Some of you will know that. It's a resistance device that helps to supposedly make things feel more like a real horn. And it does to a certain extent. However, as a dystonia patient, when I tried this, it was immediately apparent to me that the physical sensations were not nearly the same. And furthermore, playing on a buzzing, infinitely note-changeable kind of instrument is very different than a horn, which, as we all know, has very locked-in harmonics. And so we thought the best thing we could possibly do was come up with a better way of using an instrument. And this was no small task. The solution was very clever, and I have to thank Richard Serafinov of Indiana University for his ingenuity in designing and building our first MRI-compatible horn. Here you see him holding it. This horn, which to our knowledge is the only such instrument in the world, is simply a series of plastic tubes of varying diameters linked together to the same length as a horn in E-flat, a natural horn in E-flat. And it terminates, as you can see in his right hand, in a bell flare, which in this case is non-ferromagnetic. By having a subject lie down inside the scanner, snaking the mouthpiece up alongside the body to the lips, and putting the non-ferromagnetic bell at the feet of the subject, we were able to have them play inside the scanner. The next couple of pictures will make that a little more understandable. Here we see a very famous horn player, Stefan Dorr, principal horn of the Berlin Philharmonic, as he receives final instructions in preparing to go into the scanner and perform. As you can see in the next two pictures, the idea, as I said, is to have subjects lying down. Here is Stefan covered in a blanket, and I'm simply running the hose up alongside his body with the mouthpiece attached to its end, and we're attaching the non-ferromagnetic bell to the table at his feet. The picture on the right shows him sent into the chamber itself, and in that position he's able to play, yes, lying on his back, but still able to play and feel and hear an instrument which is much more like a real horn than just a mouthpiece. Now mind you, an MRI scanner is quite loud. If you've ever been in one, you know this. And so, to, we, we had to ha actually have a way of amplifying the horn's sound, so we had a microphone positioned at the bell to pick up the sound and amplify it for both the subject inside and also for us to be able to record in the control room. We were in a separate room from our subject and it was very nice because we had a, an intercom system that allowed us to talk to our subjects and coach them through the playing exercises. So we were in communication at all times. It was really quite an amazing setup. Eli, I'm sure you remember what that was like playing in the MRI chamber, kind of cramped, but at least we had a microphone so that we could talk with one another while you did the exercises. Yes, I'll never forget being in the MRI chamber. It was, it was uncomfortable, but it was exciting at the <laughs> same time being part of this experiment. You know, what kind of images did you get from the MRI films? I'd be happy to show you, Eli. I have a series of slides and some films that we'll look at. Let's take a look. Now, in terms of getting you oriented to what MRI can do, I thought I'd show a couple of pictures here. 
One of the most common ways that MRI scanning is done is to take a side view, or something that we call in science a sagittal view. And here you're looking at a single sagittal image of one of our elite horn players, Jeff Nelson, former horn player in the Canadian Brass, now a professor of horn in Indiana, as I mentioned before. You can clearly make out different types of tissue in this picture. The idea is that things that show up as being bright are soft tissue. Things that are dark are bone, cartilage, and space. And you can clearly make out different types of tissue in this particular picture. Let's highlight a few of them. First, we have this bright area inside the mouth. This is the tongue. It's a huge structure when you look at the entire mouth. And you can make it out quite clearly. We also have dark areas here which represent the teeth. Here are the upper and lower incisors. We can see a structure at the back of the throat known as the epiglottis. This covers your windpipe when you go to swallow food so that food doesn't go down the wrong tube, as they say. We can see the hard palate on the roof of the mouth in the front. Toward the back of the roof of the mouth, we see the soft palate. This tissue moves considerably when one speaks and plays. We can see hanging there the uvula. That's the little punching bag that you can see in the back of your throat when you look in a mirror with your mouth open. And we can even make out the backbone here. And those bright stripes that you see are the pads, the intervertebral discs that sit between the bones making up our backbone, padding them. Of course, again, in RT MRI, real-time MRI, we're not looking at just one picture. We're looking at thousands of pictures, which are able to pick up movements that will astound you. In fact, the fastest movements recorded in MRI were done in this laboratory looking at horn players. Let me show you how we did that. You're looking here at two different videos. They are both of André Just of the Berlin Philharmonic. We asked André and all of our subjects to double tongue as fast as they could. And as you can imagine, these great horn players had some amazing speeds. André, one of the fastest, was timed at 187 beats per minute using 16th notes. Now, traditional MRI would never be able to tell you much about this. You'd be lucky to catch the tongue in any one position at any given time in shooting traditional MRI. But in our technique, because in the left-hand panel we were filming at 30 frames per second, we could see some movement. Let me show you the movie of it. This is 30 frames per second, André Just tonguing as fast as he can. Now you can see a little bit of movement there, but you can't see very clear movement. And so our technology, at least that that's been developed by Dr. Fromm and his colleagues, allows us to go much faster than that. The film on the right is MRI film captured at a speed, I don't know that there are very many labs in the world that can claim to be able to do this. They're filmed at 100 frames per second, and at that speed, we're able to capture that tongue movement. Let's watch it. Let's look at that one more time. You can see the movements quite clearly. This is astounding, and it really is a pioneering video in that respect. So we owe our German collaborators at the Max Planck Institute a tremendous debt of gratitude for their help. We are so fortunate to be able to use this technology for our studies. But that's not all. We're going to look at the use of MRI in another area now, just to give you sort of a taste of what it can do. We're going to talk about air movement. Of course, you know that using air is part and parcel of being a good horn player. Breathing and breath support we talk about all the time. And we've seen demonstrations from master teachers as they've told us the importance of tanking up. That is, increasing our thoracic volume by filling from bottom to top, side to side, and front to back virtually a three-dimensional expansion of the thorax. Well, as another example from the amazing world of RT MRI movies, let's have a look at the Berlin Philharmonic's own Sarah Willis as she tanks up for a crescendo diminuendo exercise. Watch and listen as we do this. Now, in the next slide here that you're looking at, there are three views, actually three movies. The one on the left here is a picture of Sarah from the front, and you can see her heart situated in the center of her chest the apex going down and to the right. And you can see below the heart, this is the liver, and covering the liver will be actually the diaphragm muscle, which as we know descends. And when it descends, it increases the space here on either side of Sarah's heart. These are her lungs. 
So we're going to see a front view of Sarah as she takes a big breath in and then starts playing these notes. In the middle frame, we're looking at her from the left hand side. So the front of her body is this direction, the back is here, and again we see the liver, the diaphragm muscle would cover this, and when she takes a big breath in now we're going to see that structure drop and we're going to see her chest expand front to back and her back actually move backwards as she fills with air. And then this final movie is a top view, what we call a cross section looking down virtually on top of her heart in the center here with her lungs on either side. Watch as she fills up and plays this crescendo diminuendo. There's a lot more that we could say about this breathing demonstration and we will save that for another video. But for now, I hope you can appreciate what kind of an effective tool this can be to help us understand what we do as horn players. It's fantastic stuff. Sarah Willis's breathing was amazing to see. The first time I saw that video, I just thought, I have to run and get a student and show it to them just so that they can learn how to breathe as deeply as Sarah does. <laughs> Now, as we move forward, what, what kind of strategy did you have in mind, Peter? Well, it's really pretty simple, Eli. Our strategy, of course, was to study some of the greatest players in the world, with the idea being they must be doing things right, and if we could study them, we might learn some useful information. I just want to give credit to some of the people who participated in our study, and I'm going to proceed from the upper left around in clockwise fashion to speak of each of these performers. Many of you will recognize the gentleman in the upper left-hand corner here as the principal horn of the Berlin Philharmonic, Stefan Dorr, a terrific player and so helpful to us in our study. Of course, just to the right of his picture is Eli Epstein, my colleague in putting these videos together. Eli played for years in the Cleveland Symphony and teaches both at the Boston Conservatory as well as the New England Conservatory of Music. To the right of his picture is Fergus McWilliam, another Berlin Philharmonic artist. To the right of his picture, Stefan Laval Jaszierski, yet another Berlin Philharmonic performer. To his right, we have Marie-Louise Neunecker, a famous recording artist living in Germany, a terrific horn player. And below her picture, we have Marcus Mascuniti. Marcus is a very well-known player in Europe, plays in many European orchestras and now teaches in Hanover, Germany as well. Just to the left of his picture is Jeff Nelson, Canadian brass and now uh, at Indiana University. Of course, to his left we have the very familiar face of Sarah Willis, the host of Sarah's Music, a Berlin Philharmonic performer. And here you see her holding the MRI horn in the Max Planck Institute MRI facility. This was an occasion back in April of 2015 when Sarah was there to film along with me and with Dr. Fromm a series of videos that were used uh, on her program, Sarah's Music, featured as an episode called Science in Music. Just to the left of Sarah's picture then we have André Just, also of the Berlin Philharmonic. We are really so grateful to these wonderful performers for their cooperation and for being willing to let themselves be studied to help science and also to help the world of horn pedagogy. Our goal is to provide a scientific basis for teaching the horn. Every time I see a new video, I get so excited about all the information that's being unlocked, that's being available to us now. Our hope is that this new information will help us learn to teach and play the horn in natural, intuitive, and sustainable ways. We move forward with a lot to ponder about our teaching and our playing. May we and our students and our students' students have long, healthy, satisfying careers. <laughs>